Uh, hey, this is Maria. Um, I'm uh, sitting here talking to Scott Sigler, and uh, we are uh, getting ready to do a little bit of an interview for Mad Art Lab. Scott, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Um, so, Scott, you are currently promoting your book Nocturnal, which is about to come out. Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, about that? Well, Nocturnal is hard science horror story set in San Francisco. My first. Uh, three novels for Crown have been set in Michigan where I grew up and where I uh, spent my time and uh, Nocturnal having been in San Francisco for a few years first one there and it's it's kind of a combination monster story hard science story and throwback to the 80s buddy cop movies I've got two two uh, two police officers who kind of have that old boy 80s patter between them and as the story progresses they go from being um, homicide detectives to discovering something really sordid and untoward underneath the streets of San Francisco, something that comes out only at night to feed on the dregs of society. So that's why the book is called Nocturnal. And this this cult or this group comes out to prey upon the people who won't be missed, who they call the won't be. You know, bums, indigents, people who are um, you know I- immigrants that have a Devon declared or just living off the streets. Anybody who won't be missed, they prey on them. And our protagonists find out about this and try and get involved and do something about it. Right. That's great. So, um, so, so talk a little bit about your uh, experience with um, getting the science right in a story that really has um, very fantasy, huge fantasy elements like monsters and things like that. Well, getting the science right is, you know, the, I often talk about this and then I try and make it as scientifically accurate as possible, all of my books. Except uh, there's a reason that lab research doesn't produce a lot of monsters. This stuff doesn't actually happen in real life. So you try and keep things as close to scientific accuracy as possible, but then push it an extra 10 or 20% beyond the realm of what we're capable of right now. And I'm fortunate enough to have people who started out as fans of the podcast who are now, I've got two PhDs and an MD, and these people... They'll read the, the initial concept of the book, and then they'll read the first draft, they'll read the second draft, and they're able to go through it and say, okay, what you've got here is really good, or what you've got here, you don't really understand what's going on with this particular field of genetics. Maybe I can adjust your story for you. And then a lot of times what will also happen is you know, you'll get a link and be like, look what we just discovered last week. You should work this in because now we have a better understanding of genetics, etc. So... It's a kind of a constant ongoing arm race in the story to try and make things as accurate as possible. And that's the higher level. The lower level is I'm constantly introducing things that people already know. It's things you learned from science in high school, possibly you took any sciences in college, and that's the, the way I build up street cred with the reader. The more things I feed you that you already know, that creates a bit of empathy between the reader and the author and you start to believe anything that I tell you. It's kind of a con game that I'm playing. So as I build up this level of trust, you allow yourself to go deeper into the rabbit hole and believe the story. Then when I get to the really crazy stuff that normally you would say, oh, this will never happen, you are in and you believe it and you follow along with the story. Right. And uh, now your kind of methodology for, for writing books has been a little bit unusual in that you've, you've podcasted things ahead of publishing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so how long was really Nocturnal in the making? I started podcasting Nocturnal in 2008, mm-hmm. and that was the one and only book that I've done. I'm going to write a chapter, and then I'll podcast that chapter. And it was very popular with my listening audience, but uh, it created a lot of problems. Whereas once you've put an episode out in public, and then five episodes later you want to go back and change things, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So. It totally constrained me to uh, a first take, first draft type approach. And that was back in 2008. It took over a year and a half to finally get the whole thing through. It wound up being a 240,000 word novel, which equates to about um, about 800,000 pages in hardcover. And then I, just this year, I started working on the book with the editors at Crown. So we had to go through and we had to tear everything apart. There were an enormous amount of problems with the story. Everybody loved the story and they were listening to it episodically. It was much more like a, a, a 50 serial novel where you weren't really that concerned if things didn't line up. 
But now that we're putting it out in hardcover, and it's going to be in all the bookstores everywhere, we had to really tear it apart and make sure everything lined up. So the process has been three years, probably five full drafts from beginning to end, to rework the whole thing to get to what we have now. And did you find that in that time, either with this book or with, uh, with some of the others that you've done sort of similar things with, that the science has changed in that time? So you've been able to tweak things based on um, new findings, like you said, or... Uh, or you know something interesting that's coming. Um, yeah, there's there, there's been some of that, and there is not to give too much away, but there are there are people in this book that are capable of doing physical things that are beyond the pale of a normal human being. So there's the science in that that has developed since I started writing in 2008 is uh, better knowledge about the structural integrity of the human skeleton, better knowledge about um, double muscling, which is a shorthand term for something I don't really understand all that well, and, and, and being able to, to physically explain how people are capable of what would be considered a, hu- a superhuman level of strength. So a lot of that knowledge has come in, so there have been recent developments, and then the guys who do the research for me, they also have broadened their research, and also it becomes, uh, for the, the scientific consultants, this is really fun for them, because they've got their line of research that they're working very hard on, to try and build a company or, or get published or do things within the university. And then I come in and go, how would somebody scramble up the face of a five-story building? <laughs> and then they're like, this is great. And then they get to they get to dive in and, and go into the toolkit. So um, things of that nature have been impacted by developments in science, as have um, being the, the hereditary nature of, of learned experiences or trying to find a way to justify almost Lamarckian type genetics. All right, th- you're born, and then this happens to you to make you develop this way. Would there be a way to pass that on to future generations? And there actually have been some developments in the research of that, some research into um, trauma, for example, from women who are in their third trimester during 9 11 who lived in New York or in the buildings or around the buildings and increased levels of, of trauma in their children. So there are some developments that have come up very recently that I've read about that we were able to kind of squeeze in at the last minute into the story. So, But that's a double-edged sword because you try and make it as accurate as you can, and then in the 18 months it takes for the book to actually come out, and the time you finish it, a bunch of stuff changes, and it's not accurate anymore. Right. And do you ever have like a, a, a struggle with the conflict of things being you know very detailed and very scientifically accurate versus... Having you know, and and having a lot of sort of complexity in what you're trying to explain versus trying to make a compelling story, either either you personally or kind of from the publisher level, mm-hmm. think we're trying to market this to a mainstream audience and they're going to struggle with that. Well, this is my fourth book for a mainstream audience. I wrote Infected, Contagious, Ancestor, and Now We're in a Nocturnal. So now I'm better at the job, which is more refined at telling the story. And first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a storyteller. I'm a suspense thriller storyteller. There just happens to be a lot of horror and science elements mixed in. And it's been a process. The first book I wrote, Infected, I had an endless battle with uh, the publisher because that's basically Infected's a concept of self-assembling materials, hijacking the human cellular reproductive process, basically treating us like we treat bacteria. We'll, use bac- we'll re- recode bacteria to make insulin, some other entity is recoding us to make something else that they need. And I had just pages and pages of all this scientific explanation and, uh, and, and got a lot of pushback from the publisher being like, this is all super cool, but you're going to lose the casual reader. You're getting away from storytelling and, be, and it's turning into a scientific lecture. So that is a skill I've had to develop because to me it's also effing cool and I can't imagine there wouldn't be anybody who would want to read all of this stuff and learn all this stuff, but that's not, it's not a textbook. Right. So uh, it, it does come back to you need to make it accurate, you need to give it give enough information to support the rest of the story, but then largely you have to walk away because it's a story about your characters and the people that they are and the troubles that they encounter and how they overcome them. That's the primary thing that I'm doing. Everything else is just support structure. Right. So uh, the, the one thing that I, I thought was really fascinating about the book, particularly from the perspective of the skeptics, is you actually have... A, a highly skeptical character in the book who's, mm-hmm. who identifies openly as atheist um, and and uh, he's one of the two kind of buddies in the in the in the cop team mm-hmm. um, 
but you know, again, without giving too much away, I thought it was very interesting that when they were in a situation where things were uh, quote unquote unbelievable, it was really the believer who was the one who had to who had to believe in what you know had to go against what everything rational was telling him mm -hmm. and, and sort of believe in his partner and and in some ways have faith in that partner. Do you think that was? Sort of a, um, a not a, a important for that for that particular character to be a believer in that situation. Well, I set it up. I set up the two characters so that we had a we had a skeptic, we had an atheist skeptic, and then we had um, we had a, a Christian, a believer, but who wasn't a proselytizer. He's right. like, hey, if you don't believe in it, that doesn't bother him at all. And what was interesting is the story develops. The atheist character is in just a giant world of shit as things are falling apart all around him and he is fingered for a crime, in effect. I mean, he's the most likely suspect. If you believe the, if you if you believe in logic and observing evidence and using you just using common sense, he's the guy who did it. And then his partner is the Christian is the believer. So in a way it was easier for him to follow that same mentality of his life and just to go on faith. I don't think my partner did it because even though I'm a cop and everything tells me he did it, it doesn't feel like he did it. So he's able to just kind of, he's very consistent. He's got his belief in the supernatural and in the, in the beyond. That same belief structure applies to his partner and allows him to support his partner throughout the whole thing. Right. So it's a real, it's, it's not a major part of the story. It's not a philosophical battle between these characters. But largely, they're both, it's modeled a bit after my brother and I. I'm atheist, my brother's a born-again Christian, and it's not really a problem. We just both have a belief system, so I was able to put that into the characters. Um, and hopefully there's, uh, hopefully there's somewhat of a, a parable or a lesson there that somebody doesn't have to believe the same thing you believe, pretty much as long as they aren't hurting anybody or trying to convert anybody to anything, kind of no harm, no foul. But it did, it did factor into the character and make them more believable in their path in the story. Right. That's great. So, uh, so when when can we read it? When's it out? That is out April third. Okay. Uh, Nocturnal's out April third from Crown Publishing. Um, it's available for pre order now. Don't know when this uh, this interview will come out, but you can order it from scottsigler.com slash nocturnal or Amazon or Barnes and Noble or there's a, a store in San Francisco called Borderlands Books, which is borderlands bookscom and they have autographed copies. So if anyone wants to pre order an autographed copy, they can get it from there. Very cool. And you also have uh, the Infected Graphic Novel that's coming out, yep. right? For yep. people who have already potentially maybe maybe have read Infected. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, we're super excited about that. That's actually been in the works since 2008. Um, Chad Minshew is an artist who was a fan and started drawing the book. And then last year at Comic-Con, went to Comic-Con and took some of his pages and just went from booth to booth and being like, I have this book, I'm a New York Times bestseller, he's a polished artist, look at what we've got, who wants to, to put this book out? And the company that jumped on it was IDW, and they, they do an enormous, they do G.I. Joe books, and they do Buffy books, and they do Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, they also put out a, an award-winning series from Joe Hill um, called uh, Lock and Key, so they're making all kinds of super cool things and they're the ones who are going to put the book out, and it's a graphic novelization of Infected. And I think uh, the people who've already read Infected are really going to dig, really see these characters brought to life. And and Chad's the driving force behind this. He's just the artist is phenomenal. Does he do justice to the gore? Uh, yeah, he does justice to the gore. He does justice to the characters. He's really good at at, at making his art actors and conveying emotion with the the, the face with the faces. So he's incredibly talented, and IDW seems to be behind it. So it'll sell real well to my existing audience, but I think it's going to get a whole new group yeah. of people because the, the graphic novel as a medium has just blown up over the past five, six years. So we're really looking to see what can happen with that. My hopes is successful with the graphic novel, and the graphic novel's a, a finished storyboard. We're able to hand that off to Hollywood and somebody want to make a movie. Yeah, absolutely. That's the plan. All right, well, you know, uh, everyone at Mad Art Lab is a huge fan of your work, so we, uh, we're looking forward to everything that you do. Uh, anything else you want to plug or talk about? No, no right. that's about it. That's All our right. full slate for now. That's awesome. Well, yep. thanks a lot. All right, thank you.